Okay, in my talk, I will be surveying criticisms of ergodicity economics. So why bother doing this? As EE uh, reaches new audience, uh, I think people are aware it's facing a growing list of criticisms. Many of these criticisms have not been formally addressed. Uh, and yet I think addressing these criticisms is important to push forward the, the theory, uh, push forward the science, provoke new experiments, to help with the communication uh, and ultimately assess one's credence in the framework, the movement uh, and, the, and the theoretical foundations. The approach I'll take is to survey, prioritize and thematize the strongest and if not strongest, the most frequent criticisms that at least I have observed personally. I will strongman these criticisms uh, to the best of my abilities wherever possible and expand them in the direction in which I think they're intended. They're not my criticisms generally, but I do sort of try to push them forward to make them better. Um, and ultimately, the aim of this is to engage with the critics, to take them seriously and to help provoke responses from the EE community in the discussion and from the critics. So the first one uh, pertains to uncertainty over wealth. So, and this is all in the voice of the critics. EE agents care only about time average growth rates. Real agents, however, care about wealth itself. Even if finite time average growth rates converge over time, wealth can diverge and therefore risk remains. So this is an example uh, that I'll show from Ilari Letty. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his name. I hope I have um, done that. This is a multiplicative gamble um, uh, showing with different colored lines, different, different realizations or different agents uh, uh, taking that multiplicative gamble. The finite time average growth rates converge over time to zero, even though it's not obvious here. And yet the wealth diverges over time. So time average growth rates converge and wealth diverges. Similarly, um, suppose two gambles, same time average growth rate, but different volatility. So think of a, a risk-free um, Certain, certainty equivalent growth uh, versus a risky multiplicative gamble. According to the critics, at least, E predicts agents should be indifferent. Uh, more technically, this, they should show no second order stochastic dominance um, for the risk free over the risky. More generously, if EE doesn't predict, sort of positively predict indifference, then at least its second order effects are outside of its scope. And that's still a criticism for not explaining that. Intuition and experience, however, suggest that real agents do prefer the lower volatility options. Um, and therefore, real agents care about more than just growth rates. So I'm showing tweets, by the way, just to reference this, the people that are pushing forward this criticism. It's not comprehensive, there are probably others who have made the same criticism. Uncertainty of growth rates. EE doesn't explain how agents behave when uncertain about time average growth rates. When the time average growth rate itself is a random variable. So even when you um, even when you take time to infinity, the time average growth rate can still be a random variable if you're uncertain about that. Only sometimes do you know the deterministic time average growth rate for long time periods. So for instance, fixed rate mortgages was one example. Frequently time average growth rates must be estimated under uncertainty. And when they are, what does the EE agent to do? So this uh, line of criticism was put forward by Ben Golub. Uncertainty over dynamics. Uh, this is a this is a criticism that I've that I've seen, but I've pushed it forward a little bit more than the others in this talk. So dynamics are almost always hidden from the agent. We're not Mother Nature doesn't doesn't allow us to see what the what the dynamics underlying our environment are. We just make observation and we 
we do, we don't, we're not privy to the, to the underlying dynamics. Another way to state this is that dynamics are latent states of a generative process, where the generative process is, is the environment with which we're interacting. EE agents correctly identify the dynamic and apply the correct ergodicity transformation in those null models, right? There's, there's no talk about how they infer the, the, the dynamic, it's just assume that they, they know the dynamic and they correctly apply the uh, ergodicity transformation. In other words, this is an oracle model that has sort of magical access to the, to the ground truth. But what if agents are uncertain about the dynamics that they face? And this is quite plausible. The uncertainty can manifest uh, in different ways. So you might be uncertain about its structural form, its parameters, its boundaries, so whether dynamics change at certain wells or they change at certain time points. Um, and that also pertains to stationarity, whether the dynamics are stable over time or whether they're subject to change at any particular time. What if agents are, agents might be relatively certain about the dynamics, but they still might be uncertain about the ergodicity transformation that they should apply and so on and so forth. Another line of criticism is the implausibility of linear utility. So EE predicts that agents should maximize linear utility under additive dynamics. Linear utility effectively assumes agents to access infinite credit line, make decisions independent of their wealth, express an indifference to certain T equivalent gamble. So if you have a certain, if you have a risky gamble versus a certain equivalent, then if you have linear uh, utility, you are indifferent between those two. And that they would pay any price to play an additive version of the St. Petersburg paradox. Um, Brad Cameron more than most and uh, also Chris Merrill have particularly pushed forward this uh, line of criticism. Preferences over uh, lower growth rates. So here is a hypothetical game in which real agents will ostensibly self-evidently prefer a lower growth rate and this violates EE. And again, this is the voice of the critic. Um, so this is from Peter Wacker uh, and colleagues um, paper. Uh, would a person ever prefer a process that after three rounds diminishes wealth from 10,000 to half a cent over one that yields a 99.9% .9 chance of 10 million and otherwise effectively very close to zero. Um, so they show that the, this, this one with the, with the high chance of 10 million actually has a lower time average growth rate than the one that certainly drops your wealth to 0.5 cents. So the claim is that you would prefer the 99% chance, 99.9% .9 chance of 10 million. Um, and yet that's the one with the lower growth rate. So I'm pretty sure um, uh, Ole and Alex have a lot to say about this, um, but we'll, we'll wait for the discussion on that. They have probably have a lot to say about most of these criticisms. One shot gamble and uh, finite uh, horizon games. Uh, so this is probably the most common criticism I've encountered. So EE requires repetition of gambles over long horizons for agents to realize the time average growth rate within their lifetime or within some chunk of their lifetime. This is implausible in the real world where repetition of the same or similar gambles often uh, is not possible. And therefore EE cannot handle single bets and EE cannot handle bets repeated infrequently over short horizons. Um, many people have put this forward. Uh, here are two examples from Ilari and Adam. The Kelly criterion. So many critics say that the only part of EE worth keeping is that which repackages the Kelly criterion, um, which most of the critics that I'm aware of actually think is important. 
But then they would say that we knew this already and we already know its limitations. Um, so what does EE ultimately add? Um, so this is this is expressed by Ben Gola, but I've I've heard other people say the same thing. EE assumes individual differences are not important. Um, so this is from uh, Peter Wacker's paper. So he states that Peters, early Peters, uh, is suggesting that growth is the primary factor explaining economic phenomena and that utility. Um, um, uh, sorry, that attitudinal factors, idiosyncrasies, psychological differences are not that important. Um, and then Peter is pointing out that people are different self evidently. Um, and that you cannot predict choices directly from stimuli, and that there's a huge body of economic studies to that find interpersonal variations, and they are predictive of all sorts of other phenomena. Subjectivity of dynamical models. So EE claims advantage, uh, claims it has an advantage, which is to circumvent the psychological complexity and the theoretical freedom that this affords are in most economic models. However, one problem with this is that real agents can't access dynamics directly, like an oracle. They, they have to construct generative models of these dynamics through mental models, through neural systems, however you prefer to think about this, the agent still needs to build a model of their environment and the dynamics within that. These models are inevitably, they have to be hierarchical, they have to be mutable, and they are most certainly phenotypically variable. And this EE's requirement to estimate dynamics requires agents to build dynamical models, which requires more theoretical complexity than was originally circumvented. Um, this this is a criticism that I've I've sensed and put together, but I've sort of pushed it a bit further than it's gone before. Okay, so that was um, all the criticisms that I could fit into twelve minutes. Uh, I'm hoping that will be uh, provocative of a good discussion, um, both in terms of the responses from the EE community, but also from the critics. Uh, I had to resist temptation to respond myself, but I, I have a few things to to offer uh, in response. Thank you.